Hi everyone, this is Nick Pollock here from Roar Lions Roar. While you're here, be sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that alert bell so you never miss any of our new content. And if you prefer to listen instead of watch, make sure you check us out on your podcast platform of choice where you can subscribe and download each new episode. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening. Go State! Hello everybody and welcome back to Roar Lions Roar. You know, as I say that, Matt, I was thinking to myself, what? do we really need to say Roar Lions Roar off the top every time? I don't think so. I think if you're here, you know where you are, right? Right. I, mean, if, like if you, I guess if you accidentally found us, I don't know how that would happen, but or if um, it just auto played like did. on Spotify, yeah. I guess that's I guess that's possible. Yeah. But hi everyone. I'm Nick Pollock. I'm your host tonight here for Roar Lions Roar, in case you can't read. Um, which, you know, honestly, you know, if you can't read, podcast would be a great medium for you. So you're definitely in the right place then. Um, I'm joined tonight by Matt DeBear. Matt, how are you? I am chilly. It, it it got cold fast over here in the uh, the upper Midwest or wherever I'm considered to live. But there was snow yesterday. Um, there was ice on my patio. It uh, it went from fall to winter very fast. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't get like I I won't really get the cold weather necessarily. Like it'll get cold out here in Seattle, but it won't get like crazy cold. But what is what we are very much in like now is that. I won't see the sun after like 4 45 PM, which is a major bummer. Um, but you know, we have super long, super long sunny days in the summer. So I guess it kind of evens out. Is it like that in Michigan? Yeah, we get, uh, I don't know what time the sun sets here. We're so far West in the Eastern time zone that without daylight savings time ending, I don't think the sun rises here until like noon. If we just, <laughs> if the clock, if we just stayed on the on summertime year round. Um, but, uh, no, it's, it's, I think by the, like the earliest the sun sets, you know, next month is like, you know, four forty five five o'clock. But yeah, we get, um, especially up North in the summer, which Northern Michigan, the summer is like top five greatest things on the planet. It stays light out until, you know, 10, 10 30, you know, at the, the peak of the day of the year. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I already have a lot of travel plans for that for next year, but I, in the coming years, I want to come visit Michigan slash Wisconsin in the summer and just do like a golf course, just, you know, rapid, just knock out all the big ones all in like one week. Um, by the way, if my voice sounds like a little funny now and then to any of you listening, I do apologize. I started doing Invisalign like a couple weeks ago, Invisalign, not a sponsor, but could be, um, but it does make my voice sound just a little bit funny. So I apologize for that. If it does, um, we are here today, Matt, to talk about what was, you know, it, I mean, it's not statistically the most dominant Penn state win, um, even in the James Franklin era, but you know, considering how long the backups played in the second half and considering just how truly like dominant they were in the first, like this feels like one of the more dominant wins in the, at least the James Franklin era of Penn state. Yeah, it was, um, you know, right from the opening kickoff, it's not even, you know, the opening snap or the opening series, you know, Maryland, foolishly took the ball out of the end zone on the opening kickoff from like two or three yards deep and maybe got back to the 10. And yeah. then uh, I got to pull up the play by play here. Cause it was just, it was funny. Um, you know, for incomplete pass in the first play, 11 um, yard return. So they got to the, it took it from the goal line. So they started at the 11. Um, so the incomplete pass in the first play, which I think was impacted by the pass rush mm -hmm. short run on second down. And then Zane Durant sacks uh, Taka Viola on the, third play of the game that's right and that was and then Penn State goes right down the field you know nine plays 50 yards give or take in four and a half minutes um really didn't face a whole lot of adversity on that drive and just it felt kind of over from there um especially when you look at what Maryland did, then did with the ball as soon as they got it back right. another sack for Adisa Isaac incomplete pass and then the Arguably one of the funniest plays of the James Franklin era, uh, the pass to the offensive lineman, yeah. <laughs> um, which which had shades of, of Gary Nova seven or eight years ago to me. But um, the game kind of felt over at that point. It just felt like Penn State was going to be able to do whatever they wanted to Maryland's offense, especially up front, um, which has kind of been the story of the last two games. I haven't talked uh, to you or really anyone um, on the podcast since before the Indiana game, but the last four, you know, eight quarters of football, they've just been utterly dominant um, up front on defense. And that's, I think, allowed them to probably be a little bit more conservative on offense. You know, they, yeah, it was, it, it 
turned into one of those games very early on where unless Penn State was going to shoot themselves in the foot or hand Maryland the ball in great field position or, you know, give up a special team score or something like, like something like that, Maryland wasn't going to be able to hang with them. Um, you know, it, it wasn't pretty like we'll talk about here in a little bit, but um, it was it was certainly as dominant a defensive performance as we've seen um, in the, gosh, this eight seasons we've had with James Franklin now. Yeah, for me, once once Adisa Isaac got that sack on the second Maryland possession, that was where I was like, yeah, this game is over. Like, there's not... <laughs> and I, I feel like I was one of the few, um, at least among... Not, and I wasn't the only, but like definitely among our ourselves, I, I feel like I was probably the most confident about this game. I know you were pretty confident too, but like I know Bill was a little worried. Um, I know Flip was at, at least tentatively worried. I think Craig was a little unsure at least. Um, but I don't know. Like this... I, I I never felt like this was the Maryland team that was going to be able to beat this Penn State defense, even without Joey Porter Jr., even without Curtis Jacobs. Like, um, it's I I never really felt much in danger um, as a Penn State fan in this one. Um, but yeah, Penn State won this game by a final of thirty to nothing. Um, and I think we're mainly important to focus on the first half here because you know Penn State. I think Clifford had what uh, two drives in the second half, maybe before Aller came in, and then quickly after Aller came in Christian value wasn't far behind him so uh, like really it was only it was a half like the second half was just a whole lot of nothing with all the backups and the rain and all that stuff so uh first half Penn State was up 27 nothing at the break in the first half alone Penn State 281 total yards they finished with 413 on the day Maryland in the first half had 27 total yards they had three drives that netted that netted negative yardage that is absolutely insane for an offense that I, they've been scuffling the last two weeks now like this this started last week for them but like this is and and the rain obviously plays a factor here too but this has not been a quiet offense like this has been a pretty good offensive team for most of the season like they put up points they put up yardage um but just Utter, utter, utter dominance. Sean Clifford on the day, 12, 23 passing, 139 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Talia Tungavello on the other side, 11 of 22 for 74 yards. Nick Singleton, 11 carries for 122 yards. I believe all but maybe like nine of those yards came in the first half. Uh, 11.1 yards per carry, two touchdowns. Catron Allen also had 16 carries for 73 yards. 12 different receivers caught passes to the, on Saturday for Penn State. Theo Johnson led the team three catches for 44 yards. Brenton Stranger, three catches for 34 and the only touchdown pass of the day. Um, the defense had seven sacks and nine tackles for loss. Chop Robinson, of course, former Maryland player, uh, transferred before this season, had two sacks on the day. Uh, Maryland did not have a sack, which is significant when you remember the fact that Olu Fashano was out. Uh, Landon Tengwall was ruled out for the year prior to this game, so he was obviously out. Um, but so the fact that they managed zero sacks on Sean Clifford and Drew Aller and Christian Veyu, that's significant. Um, you know, in total in this game, I, like I said, Maryland only 27 yards in the first half, only 134 total in the game. That makes two consecutive games now that Penn State's defense has held their opponent under 200 total yards, which is quite ridiculous and i know indiana's hurting like we said maryland's on a cold streak but if you can hold a college football team a big 10 college football team under 200 yards that is pretty crazy and not something that happens often to do it in two consecutive games is pretty ridiculous wild Matt. wild yeah there, there was a point i mean this is well into the game i think it's in the second quarter um, where in, in our Slack channel, Craig made a comment, Is Maryland ha, does Maryland have positive yards? And they did for a brief second when he asked the question. I think they were at like three and, and then, then proceeded they, to yeah. lose like eight yards on the next play. Um, and this is, I think, was in the second quarter. Um, yeah. It was just, it was that kind of kind of day. And I think, you know, you know, looking at the team stats, like you said, you know, they gave up a hundred and whatever it was, yards on the 134. That even feels generous. You know, a lot, and a lot yeah. of that came second half garbage time, you know, Penn State emptied the bench. You know, the stadium was maybe half full at that point. The weather yeah, was... Yeah, I mean, 107 was, of it came in the second half. Of their 134, 107 came in the second half. Well, it, it, it didn't even feel like that much. It just was, you know, I'm, I'm sitting on the couch watching the game, and it just, you know, they were playing out the string in the second half. And, you know, names that are being called, you know, as far as making tackles and and whatnot it was just um when they mentioned that hemby had gone over 60 yards i was shocked i was like what really that does not yeah, it's, sound it's, accurate <laughs> and it was um 
just you know, it, it was a continuation, I think, of what they did against Indiana, which I which was um, you know, again, like you said, Indiana is, you know, arguably one of the worst teams in the Big Ten. Maryland clearly not the same offense they were in the first half of the year after you know, Tug of Bailoa is not a hundred percent, not even remotely close. You know, he missed yeah. the Northwestern game a couple of weeks ago. Um, really struggled for them. Um, Jarrett just came back the, from the prior week for this game. Yeah. It just, you know, they, they are clearly not, not, you know, firing all cylinders like they were in the first part of the year, but it's a dangerous offense. It has a lot of skill talent with Jarrett, with Demby. Um, Tagovailoa certainly can throw the ball when he's a hundred percent, but they didn't, they didn't give them a really an ounce of oxygen, you know, from the opening snap of the game, you know, they were in his face. Um, and I think you mentioned a little bit of uncertainty or uneasiness leading to the game. And you, oh gosh, you know, Curtis Jacobs is out. Oh no, Joey Porter Jr. is out. You know, this is, they're facing arguably the most prolific when healthy offensive passing game in the Big Ten, other than maybe Ohio State. And that didn't even remotely factor in. They, they did, made that, a, a, they took care of that concern you're right off the bat and you know, not to belabor the point, Maryland's not healthy, but that, you know, I think a, a 80% or whatever he is, Rakeem Jarrett is certainly a, a, a player that can be dangerous. Demby is a guy that's, you know, burnt them in the past and the type of passing attack that they have shown in the past really could have exposed, I think Penn state's biggest weakness on defense at linebacker. Uh-huh. And by getting in his face, putting them behind the sticks, you know, really, you know, impacting the passing game with the front four um, and, you know, the periodic pressure from the linebackers and, and secondary just really, you know, eliminated that concern by not giving him time or space to be able to really do anything to, to expose that potential mismatch. Yeah. Once Penn state was able to prove that they were going to be able to affect Tunga, Tunga Valoa all game with, only their front four like that was over that was it like if if you can get to him with only your front even on like a beautiful day with everyone healthy all that stuff if you can get to tongue of Iloa in the backfield because he's never been good under pressure like he's he's a really talented quarterback but he's always struggled with pressure so if you can make that happen with just your defensive line and be able to have everyone drop back even with the questions about linebacker like that was going to be a problem for him um and it was obviously really cool to see Chop Robinson be the one kind of leading the way with that. Um, I loved the, as I was looking at the team stats, I hadn't seen this quote anywhere else. I saw this quote from uh, Chop Robinson on the ESPN recap saying, um, he said, you can, when you see the guys, when you see their guys turning against each other, arguing with each other, once their offense starts doing that, that's when you, that's when you know you have them. That's when you can take control of the game. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Um, like, I don't, I, I don't hate Maryland. I, like I, I don't hate Maryland. It's just really funny to me when they lose. Like I, th- if like they're a program with a lot of like, um, like you know, leading back. To, like I don't think it's because of the Stefan Diggs and the other captains non handshake thing. Like I, I mean that was weird, but I don't really care about it in the long term. But like they just get very, like it's a cycle every year. Like Maryland fan, like they start three and they beat some random other Power Five team that they're not supposed to beat in the first three weeks, they look really good. And then they just get smoked by all those same big 10 teams that they always get smoked by. So it's just funny to me when they lose, I'm sorry, Maryland fans. I'm sorry. Anyone listening who has well, there's, a, there's a level of like, like, um, you know, not to, to steal the Michigan, Michigan state little brother thing from Mike Hart all those years ago, but it's, it's kind of yeah. like that. It's like, you know, they get hope every year, you know, they get all excited. They think this is the year. And then, Penn State has found so many different ways to crush that hope when they've ultimately met. And yes, I know they've beaten Penn State twice, but once was that 14 game where they had like nine scholarship players in the COVID year, which the further we get away from it, the less it matters. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they've had the the close win in Baltimore with Christian Hackenberg. Um, I think that was the 15 game. You know, they've had the Friday night game that we all remember, the 59 nothing <laughs> blowout. They've had multiple blowouts like that um, to end the season in, in the DJ Durkin era in, in college park. Um, it's just, they, they've found unique, even the game last year, which was you know kind of in doubt and Maryland's driving. Oh, they're going to, you know, you're going to you know pull it within. And then Jair Brown gets the pick six in the old red, in the uh, red zone and re- returns it for you know 85 yards or whatever it was for the touchdown yeah. to really put the game away. Like just, even that, just, you know, showing them hope, you know, here's the ball and then pulling it away at the last second, you know, the whole, you know, um, Lucy and Charlie Brown kicking the field goal thing. It's kind of that, yeah. um, 
in different ways. It's, you know, they, they've had that hope, like you said, um, you know, th- this year it was, it wasn't so much the big win against the non-conference team. It was playing Michigan close. I think it was a seven point game earlier in the year. Um, and now mm-hmm. here they are, yeah. it's at six and four, probably six and five with um, Ohio state coming to Maryland next week. Um, and then it all comes down to that big uh, Maryland Rutgers season finale to, to get bowl. El- well, I guess they are bowl eligible at six wins, but to, to finish above 500 in the regular season in a year where I think they probably had higher expectations than seven and five coming in. Yeah, I agree. Pardon me for looking down. I'm trying to find, I thought Alex Kirshner, friend of the pod, Alex, Alex Kirshner actually put it really well. Um, yeah, here it is. Maryland Penn state is a very one-sided rivalry in that Penn state people do not care about it. Parentheses. And in this case, they're being honest, unlike with Pitt, where half of them are and half of them aren't, but Maryland has to care because they can't get their lunch eaten and DMV recruited. I think that's really accurate. Like I, I mean, it's, I guess it is kind of, Pitt is a, I, I consider Pitt to be a rival. I know it's kind of weird because they don't play um, very much, but like I consider that a rivalry personally. It's, it's not with Maryland. It's, it's, it's very, um, it is, it is reminiscent of Michigan, Michigan state in a lot of ways. Um, is that like, like, I don't think Mich- I know Michigan state has won that game more often than they oh, should, especially, especially in the recent last years, 10, 15 years. Yeah. But like, like Michigan doesn't really like they care, but they, there's a game like there's a, a game that's actually going to matter to them more like later in the year. Like, and I think the, the other thing that really stood out to me that made me think of this was like, um, like when Penn state plays Pitt, like, obviously there's going to be like Penn state gets its fair share of guys from Pittsburgh and whatnot, but like more often like Pitt isn't recruiting against Penn state. Like Pitt, it, it's, just, it's, which is weird because they're in the same state. They're only what four four hours apart from each other, but they just they don't go after the same kids all that often unless they are literally from the Pittsburgh area. Um, but Penn State and Maryland are constantly going up against each other in recruiting battles. Like Maryland is constantly looking into Eastern Pennsylvania. Penn State is obviously constantly looking into the DMV area, and I it just feels like the familiarity between the players on Penn State's roster and Maryland's roster is a lot more notable than it is when you know say Penn State plays against Pitt. Um, so I, and I feel like you saw that, like you, you hear that with chops comments, obviously coming straight from Maryland last year. Um, but like, you can just tell like the chippiness of the game, like it's just different. Like it fe- like f- to the players, I think it feels more like a rivalry, but like rivalry, but for us fans, like, like, I don't, like I said, I don't care about Maryland. Like, I think it's funny yeah, when they that's... lose, but I don't care about them. Yeah. And I think you, you really hit on the point there is a lot of these guys, probably much more so than Penn State Pitt, you know, the actual on-field rivalry, I think is much more there yeah. between the, the guys, you know, between the lines. It's a lot of, you know, they grew up playing against each other. They know each other. There was the Jair Brown um, on sports like conduct penalty mm-hmm. um, when he got kind of got in Jarrett's face after a big hit on the sideline. I think it was Jarrett. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they know each other really well. I don't mean I'm, I'm not to say that he didn't deserve the penalty because you can't get in the guy's <laughs> face like that. But I, th- I think it was, he was doing it because he knew who it was. You know, this is a guy that I grew up playing against that, you know, was from the area I'm from. There's a, so much more of that in this game than probably really any other game that Penn state plays on an annual basis, or even, yep. you know, when the years Pitt's been on the schedule, just because like you said, Penn state and Maryland are recruiting the same kids, the same high schools, the same areas, much more than Penn state and Pitt are much more than, Penn State and Ohio State do much more than Penn State and Michigan do. Um, I guess to some degree, Penn State and Rutgers is kind of like that, but Rutgers is so far below talent yeah. wise. And that- I feel like the New Jersey recruiting has even dissipated a bit. Like there, th- and not that uh, part of that. I think the talent just has not been mm-hmm. quite as bountiful in New Jersey in recent years. But yeah, it's it's a little different. But yeah, similar. Yeah, so it's it's um, yeah, I I think there there is that chippiness. Yeah. I th- you saw it, you know, Robinson, Chop Robinson, obviously having come over. Um, I think after his second sack, he was pointing out, he was, you know, he didn't do it at first. I can't remember who it was. Maybe it might've been Carter is looking over at the Maryland sideline going, that's two, that's two after he got his second <laughs> sack. Um, I didn't see and that. it's, it was, it was subtle. It wasn't, you know, you know, running over and getting in, in Mike Loxley's face or anything like that. But um, I think that really underscores, why this game probably means a little more um, to the players and even to the coaching staff. You know, they brought it up on the, on the broadcast yesterday that Mike Loxley and James Franklin were on the staff together with Friedgen at Maryland um, all those years ago. James Franklin was, I don't know if he was officially or not, but was the coach in waiting before mm-hmm. that all fell apart and he left for Vanderbilt. Um, 
there's just so much more personal, I don't know if it's animosity, but personal conflict in some capacity. Yeah, between it's just more connections, which, you know, the, naturally the people leads to, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> totally. Um, all right, Matt, so let, let's, let's kind of finish up our, well, finish up the more technical side of our wrap up here. Um, let's do game balls, uh, offensively for you, who gets it? <laughs> um, I, I guess you have to go to Nick Singleton just because he had the two long touchdown runs. Um, Kate, you know, the two freshman running backs just continue to kind of be the story on offense for me. Um, yeah. It wasn't a great day to throw the ball condition wise. Um, Clifford was, you know, kind of what he is. Um, and I know that's, a, you know, trust me, we're going to talk about that. We'll get there. Or not. We'll get there. Um, but I mean, I don't know how you don't go with, Singleton and or Allen just because they were really were the guys that that moved the offense along. I thought Brenton Strange probably played well, um, but it's hard to give give a guy who only caught three passes a game ball when um, Singleton and Allen really were the guys that that you know, were the the engine for the offense. Yeah, and then um, I, I have some other thoughts on Nick Singleton, but I'm going to save them for a later part of our podcast here. Um, I'm. Uh... I guess technically they're more, they usually count more as defense, but I'm going to give it to Jake Pinniger two weeks in a row. Now 50 yard field goal. Um, so I don't remember how right far or is it just the one, the other one wasn't this, 50. It was, it was like a bit closer or something. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It was a okay. little bit closer. Um, but two, you know, really good kicks from him. And he, you know, he's had an up and down Penn state career in general. Um, uh, but these last few weeks now, um, uh, or really the last probably three or four weeks at this point, like he's, he's really been kicking the ball. Well, um, uh, he's done after this season, so we won't see any more of him after this year, but, um, really impressed with, you know, a, for a kicker, especially when you kick as long as you do for one program, your, your reputation can go sour pretty quick. Um, if, you know, cause you know, it's very easy to get in a bad rut when you're a kicker. So really happy to see him kind of turn things around here as we're nearing the end of his Penn state career. Um, really, I mean, he, he, he has a great, and he missed a lot of time last year due to injury as well, but like, he's got a great leg. A uh, big athletic kid, like I, if he can continue, you know, expanding that range, like he could potentially maybe try to find a spot in the NFL at least for a little bit. I mean, that fifty yard field, that thing was good from sixty five. That was way through. They hit the gate behind the yeah. top of the gate in the tunnel at that. And I, I'm just looking now. He's very quietly had a great year. Eleven for thirteen, two for two from fifty plus. Um, really, if you count from forty out, he's six of seven. Um, yeah apparently a couple of missed extra points, which I don't remember at all. Um, oh. And I, you know, there was, and, the, and there were the two, the both, the two misses that both didn't count against, uh, was that Ohio state? <laughs> that was the Ohio state, state game. Yeah. yeah. He, it's, yeah. he is and and this is like my golf game, I think, but he is so much more from the left hash. He's just automatic. You know, it's, I don't know if it's just a comfort thing or a visual thing. It's, you know, Nick, you and I are both golfers. But it's like you're sitting on the tee box on a hole and the the way the hole lays out in front of you just shape, fits your eye better. It's almost like that for him yeah. watching from the outside that when he's on the left side of the field, he just he is so much more comfortable. That's the ball comes off his foot better. Um, there's just you, you sense the confidence in how he, he hits the ball from that side of the field as opposed to the right side where he's almost trying to pull the ball back across his body to some degree, um, right. given the angle. But no, it, it's 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 good to see, you know, a kid that's faced a lot of adversity started out really well as a freshman, um, way back in, um, I guess his second year, his freshman year, not the best, but 2019 was solid and then dealt with injuries, um, on and off the last couple of years, really finishing up his career strong. Um, always good to see. Yeah, for sure. Um, how about defensively who gets your game ball? I'm, I'm taking the layup here with Abdul <laughs> Carter, but he was just, he was everywhere. You know, the, the seven tackles, he had a sack, he defended a pass, two quarterback hurt. He felt like he his numbers should have been way higher than that just because he was everywhere. Yeah. Um, there were just a couple plays, um, one in particular, where this this is half Tim Brando is terrible at announcing a game, <laughs> half Abdul Carter is an athletic freak. But Tiger Viola rolled out to, I believe it was to his right, and there was. There was a fair amount of green space there for a second. But watching from the sideline view, you know, the, the natural broadcast view, you see 11 kind of from the middle of the field just take off on a line towards him. And that green space that was in front of him just evaporated quickly. Yeah, I, don't know I, th if, I, I think I he made the right that, call there. <laughs> I don't think he should have run that ball. I assume that counted as a, as a hurry. But he just, it, it, there's that kind of day where he was just everywhere. There, his sack, he came through just completely untouched. Um, 
you know, I, I, I feel like on that first play of the game, he was involved in, in forcing the, the, the high throw over the middle. Mm -hmm. Um, just, you know, not to, not to take the easy line, but he's only a freshman and he's just scratching the surface of what he can become. Cause I think there's a lot of, um, you just go out and play football there. There's not a whole lot of, um, necessarily no understanding and, and reading plays and things like that. I think he's taking advantage of what an elite athlete he is. And as he starts to understand the scheme and the game and kind of what his role within the defensive system is and more and more, you're seeing the light bulb get a little bit brighter game by game. And um, gosh, we get two more years of him and that's very exciting. Yeah. You know, the, <clears throat> the game by game progression, it is really similar to, Mike Parsons, last guy to wear eleven. Like it's very, Absolutely. it's very similar. You can see it every week. Just another another piece of the puzzle gets filled in, and you're able to see him just use athleticism to his advantage. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a great one. Um, I I'm not going to give it to Zane Durant, but I will call out Zane Durant. He looked great, uh, but I'll give it to Chop. Uh, I think we are. Everyone was hoping for a big game for him uh, against his former team. Like I said, had two sacks on the day. Um, he just, you know, he even on the plays where he didn't. Um, even on the place where he wasn't getting the sacks, he was, he was in that backfield quick all day. I, I think it reminded us. Um, Cause I, was he out for, was he out for one game or two games? I think it was just the Indiana. Just the game. One. I think he got hurt yeah. against Ohio state. Yeah. It, I, and I think it was, it was noticeable when he wasn't. That's right. Cause Tarburn played a lot last week. That's right. Yeah. So he was out for Indiana. It was noticeable. Like I, for especially for a true sophomore like him, like the impact that he's able to have on the game already is pretty, uh, pretty exciting to watch. Um, another guy we get back next year, like we're, we're going to spend some time at the end here talking about kind of the future of this program, but I thought he looked great. Uh, really disruptive defensive line as a whole was outstanding for a second straight week. So awesome for them. Um, real quick, Matt, is that a home field sweatshirt I spy? It, it is. It's the, I don't know what they call this one, but it is, um, like I said earlier, it's gotten cold here in Michigan, and it's so it's officially hoodie weather for me. Um, and I've had this on all day; it's super comfortable, and I'm very warm and and cozy in it. I have been like probably once a week. I get on the website and put that in my cart, and then I'm like, yeah, nah, maybe I'll just wait. I bought you know what? I'll ask for for Christmas. Holly's been bugging me for stuff to ask for for Christmas. That's what I'll do. Um, but yeah, that's the awesome looking sweatshirt. Just like all of the home field stuff, I have plenty of t shirts. Uh, my wife has a crew neck as well. Awesome quality. We love working with Home Field Apparel. They are great sponsors. They make wonderful t-shirts made with care, made with love. Uh, like we've talked about many times before, they um, they research deep into your school's archives to find great logos, great slogans, all that stuff to use to make their shirts. Um, and they're not just screen printing on 100% cotton t-shirts. They're putting these on you know, well-made, um, just comfortable, soft shirts and sweatshirts. I, I, I think my favorite part of companies like this is the sweatshirts because like that, I think yeah, like a comfortable t-shirt versus a not comfortable t-shirt is noticeable. But when you make the difference on sweatshirts, like that's really noticeable. Um, so if you've never ordered anything from hopefieldapparel.com before, it is your lucky day because you can use the code ROAR Lions, ROAR, all caps, all one word at checkout for your very first order to get 15% off. Yeah, you heard me right. 15% off. That's crazy. Order a lot and that's a lot of money. Order a little and you're still getting a great discount on a really comfortable item. Um, but, you know, we've talked about Home Field every episode we've done here. We love we love their stuff. We love working with them. Uh, so please support them if you are able, especially as you go into the holiday season, right? Get those orders in soon because I'm sure Home Field is very, gets very jammed up and backed up during the holidays just from the pure number of orders that come in. So definitely a great idea for Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa holidays, anything you celebrate, take a look, use that order, uh, use that code Roar Lines or 15% off at your first order on check out. Let's get back to the more macro sense of this Penn State win over Maryland. Matt, what to you, I won't say the main one, let's just go with one of them. What is something that you feel like Penn State fans can walk away from this game with like whether it's just you know this defense is for real or i hate sean clifford you're wrong whatever it is like what what it, what's your what is one of the things that you think fans can take away from this week i i think this is more than just this week for me but going back to really starting with the minnesota game and i'll even include the ohio state game in this but then through indiana and then maryland on saturday is the significant contributions they're getting from 
guys with eligibility remaining that I think we anticipate to be back. You know, we've hit on the running backs ad nauseum, but we get um, at least two more years of Nicholas Singleton and Catron Allen, which is fantastic. And I can't wait to see um, how much better they get. I made the comment during the game um, that, and we've seen it over the last couple of weeks, I think with Singleton, especially that he's kind of, you see the light bulb going on for, with, on for him. I've hit on it earlier in the year where he was, you know, trying to hit that home run every time he got the ball when that just doesn't work in, in big 10 football. And I think you've seen him run more emphatically between the tackles, take what's there, you know, even if it's just four or five yards, um, you know, second and five is better than second and 12, that whole mindset. Um, But then you look at Theo Johnson, Brenton Strange, Parker Washington, Trey Wallace, um, Keandre Lambert Smith. That's just an offense. And then you look at the offensive line. Um, we are, we learned last week that Hunter Norzad will be back for um, his final year of eligibility, um, which I know is from just the way the staff views it is getting, getting him back for one more year is huge. Yeah. Um, they could theoretically get Juice Scruggs back for a, a six year due to the COVID um, next year that players that were around in the 2020 season are eligible for. Um, Salim Warmly will be back. Landon Tangwall is going to be back. I know he's missed the last couple of weeks um, and will miss the rest of the season. Um, it seems unlikely or, or um, would be a shock given the, the hype he's getting, but Olu Fashanu could be back. Um, Drew Shelton has, has really played well in relief at him at left tackle as a true freshman. Um, Bryce Effner, I, I could go on and on. At the, you know, that's just on offense. Then you go down the list in defense. Abdul Carter, we hit on. Adiza Isaac, um, Chop Robinson, Zane Durant, Devon Ellis, the, the King Twins, um, Hakeem Beeman, Kazai Azard, um, Keaton Al- on and on, Zaki Wheatley, you know, Johnny Dixon, guys that play significant roles on this team um, all will certainly be back next year. Um, you know, they're not eligible to leave yet or seems likely to very certain that they will be back might be the best way to put it. Um, and obviously there's going to be change. You know, guys that you don't expect to leave will – there's, you know, transfers are going to come in, you know, freshmen coming in the class in next year's recruiting class will we'll factor in. But this is a team that I think has really done, when you talk about the macro, what we thought, what we hoped for going into the year, that they'd be a little rocky to start the year and there'd be some hiccups. And there certainly were, um, they were lucky to get, not lucky, but, um, we're still good enough to get wins early in the season. Um, went off the tracks in Arbor, like we all know. Um, but that didn't derail the season and they've gotten better and better and better since then. And I think that's when you look at what this season was expected to be going into it back in August, you know, being eight and two is fantastic. And, you know, a really great shot at 10 and two in a new Year's six game, um, which I think we all would have signed up for um, three months ago, but I think it's how they've gotten there and how much those guys that are going to be key players in 2023 and beyond have taken on bigger roles and really thrived in them. That is really probably the biggest takeaway, certainly from the Maryland game, but really from the last month for me. Yeah. I <clears throat> rather than continue on other takeaways, I will just dive further into this point. Cause that kind of combines the next two things we're going to talk about. Um, I totally agree. Like, I, I think the big thing to take away here is that this, the, the juice behind this team, you know, the, the coal that's keeping the engine running is the under is the underclassmen, um, especially the freshmen. Like uh, you talk about Abdul Carter, Singleton, Allen, all those guys. But I think even more so than that, like looking ahead to next year, like it's almost easier to look at this Penn State roster in terms of um, who won't be back and what is that replacement because they're like you said, they're like you you can basically run down the entire roster. There's only a couple guys who are for sure not coming back. One is Jake Penninger at kicker, so you got to replace your kicker. One is Sean Clifford, obviously. Our, that's already said. Like we know it's going to be Drew Aller. We know the staff also feels really good about Bro Bo Prabula as a backup. So you know that that's already settled there. Um, you have to replace PJ Mustfer at defensive tackle. Devon Ellis, I thought is I think has played really well this year. Um, I, I I feel pretty good about the defensive tackle depth. Hopefully, Hakeem Beeman takes another step. Zane Durant, obviously, a true freshman, is already making a mark. So that's another way we can fill in for PJ Must for next year. Um, Curtis Jacobs is somebody who could potentially be gone, but he's not for sure gone. So not even going to worry about that. Um, and then Jair Brown is gone for sure. And if there's one position that Penn State is truly low to that depth wise, it's safety. So I feel pretty good about that. So and maybe not anybody as talented as Jair Brown. We'll see how they develop over the offseason. But um, that, you know, that position room is truly loaded. Um, and I guess Keaton Ellis is probably gone as well. But 
this team is fueled by players that are returning who are or can return that are going to be back next year and equally as importantly I, the coaching staff seems as stable as it's been in quite some time like i would have a really hard time one like i don't think mike yersich is gonna have any head coach offers necessarily like this offseason um but i think i don't think he'd be interested in that anyway because like drew allers is a dude like that's what he's been waiting for so i'd be really shocked to see him leave um manny diaz I guess it's possible that somebody would um, offer him a head coaching position again, but I, I, you know, the typical gestation period for former head coaches that then go off and be coordinators is usually two years before somebody you know gives them a legit offer again. And I guess a smaller school like uh, like a U- USF or something like that could offer um, Diaz and you know get him back in Florida where you know he knows a lot of people down there. But that seems unlikely to me. Juwan Sater, like. I guess you, yeah, there's always the kind of threat that one of those smaller schools in Florida will give him a chance to, you know, take advantage of his recruiting reputation, all that stuff, give him a job. But uh, like all like trout one, I don't think trout one's going anywhere. Poindexter. I feel like if he was going to go, it would have been last off season. Like it's just, it all seems pretty stable for the most part. So when you combine that with the underclassmen returning and with all these other, all these other steps of positive momentum for Penn state going into next year and into the future, that's the biggest takeaway from this season. Like Penn State, barring barring upsets, is going to go ten and two this year. Um, they're going to do it on the backs of players that are returning. They're going to do it while only losing to you know potentially top five teams at the end of the year. And you know Ohio State like very easily could have won that game, obviously. So there is a lot to be really excited about for this team, just in terms of what this season has meant um, for the future. And in terms of just getting them back to where they should be, like they are going to be in a New Year's Six Bowl this year. Like they they are getting back to that pedestal that Franklin was able to get them to ahead of schedule back in 2016 and 2017 and 2019. So that I think in just the macro is the biggest thing for this program coming out of this year. Yeah. And I think um, that, that coaching stability, I think is something that we probably don't think a whole lot about. And they're, I think we'd be foolish to say, you know, it seems like we're always surprised every off season about someone that right. um, gets an opportunity somewhere. You know, um, I was just reading the other day that um, John Scott Jr., um, his son his I think his youngest kid is a senior at um, in high school this year. So this, mm. if there's an opportunity out there, maybe this is a time that he looks to, to, to maybe take a step up or, or take on a new challenge potentially. Um, but Jawan Sider, his son, um, I think is a junior on the team this year. So it would be shocking so, yeah. on some level to see him. And, you know, you take what a coach says in public with a grain of salt, but they seem genuinely happy in state college. It's like, you know, you know, he's got his son on the team. Um, he's been here, gosh, for what, four or five years now. He's, he's really established himself as, you know, as a coach here, but he's got the Florida roots and there's, you mentioned USF, the USF job is open. Um, you know, again, you know, Anthony Poindexter went from, you know, a guy we weren't even considering as a potential um, departure last year to being a candidate for the head coaching job at Virginia. So things happen. <laughs> um, but I, the, the big players, you know, obviously James Franklin isn't going anywhere. Diaz and Yersetch would be just a shock if they leave it, if they were to um, to leave for another job. Terry Smith, you know, I think is a really integral part, both on and off the field. Um it would be shocking to see him leave at this point um, with his roots in Penn, at Penn state and the, the role he has as the associate head coach and um, yeah. with a really loaded cornerback room. Um, but I think it's Bill Conley has even hit on this, you know, in the last couple of weeks, you know, Penn state's up to seven, I think now in SP plus. And yeah. you know, he hinted at this last week with his, um, when he um, posted the, his box score of the Indiana game, that you know, start preparing now for a, a an off season of Penn State hype because it's just like we've just hit on you know the the, the talent and production that's returning that's going to be supplemented by this incoming freshman class certainly some additions from the portal um, to you know fill in some spots that don't necessarily have the depth that you'd like um, it's it's exciting and I think like I said earlier the fact that they haven't let things go off the rails after the Michigan game, they've recovered to dominate a pretty good Minnesota team, you know, who was certainly shorthanded at the moment at the time they played them um, played with, you know, another top three team in Ohio state for 50 minutes. And we don't have to rehash all that. Um, 
and then came out and, and dominated a not good Indiana team in Bloomington and then really dominated from a defensive standpoint, which on paper is a pretty good Maryland offense. So just the way they've kind of built throughout the year while getting those results on the scoreboard as well, I think is just, you know, to go back to the question that the big picture is, is really looking really good at the moment. Um, you know, they're recruiting well contributions from the right guys and those same guys are taking the next steps in their development. I think the other thing <clears throat> that's important to include too, when you talk about the guys that'll be back, you know, Penn State is usually not one of the teams that's higher ranked on that list that Bill Connolly puts out every year, the, um, the rankings in terms of returning production, um, which does go a lot into, you know, the preseason SP plus rankings as well for next year. But usually the teams that are on the top there are, you know, not, not your Ohio States, your Georgias, your Alabamas. Like those teams, are, you don't find those guys up there because they're just constantly reloading. Like guys are constantly getting shipped off the NFL. I think it's important to, you know, Penn State is going to be high on that list next year, but it's not because it's just attrition at that point. Like it's not just because, you know, well, this, uh, this, you know, two year star that, you know, he's, he's fine, whatever he's back. Like he's not going to the NFL. So he's definitely staying here. Like it's not a team full of, and I, I'm going to say this, I am going to be really careful when I say this because I think Sean Clifford has done just fine this year, but it's not a team of Sean Clifford type situations returning for Penn state. Like all these young players that are getting significant playing time and are feeling this, they, they are not starting out of necessity. Like they have beaten the guys ahead of them to become the fueling force here. Singleton and Allen, they straight out beat Kevon Lee for this job and Devin Ford and, you know, and Kaziah Holmes who transferred or put himself in the portal before the season even started. Um, like Abdul Carter has forced his way onto the field. He hasn't necessarily beaten Curtis Jacobs for the job. Jacobs was hurt this week, but like he has forced his way onto the field. Kalen King forced his way onto the field last year. Um, Kobe King made this a battle with Tyler Elsden, Zane Durant. They have, they have no reason to play a freshman defensive tackle ever. If they don't want to, he's forced his way out there. Like this entire line, the say all the safeties that um, get rotation, the guys on um, offense. Like, uh, I, I guess you could argue maybe Amari Evans is the one exception because he's the only real burner they have at receiver right now that I guess is ready to play at least. But these are young players that have fought their way into the starting role. It's not just a matter of well, no, we have no one else who can play here. Let's throw you in there. That's what's going to make this team so dangerous going into the future and what makes them so dangerous now. This is a young, hungry team that is pissed off that they lost to Michigan and Ohio State, and they want to finish this season as strong as they possibly can. So that's really exciting just for the future of Penn State in general. However, it's not all roses coming out of this game because once again, the debate that has taken years off my life since the blue and white game. Honestly, um, I think we need to spend a little time talking about Sean Clifford and drew Aller here. First of all, Matt, do you have any issues with the way that drew Aller was used in this game? None zero. And, I, and I, I'll elaborate on that because I think there was again, Tim Brando and, and I don't remember who was doing the, the color commentary, Spencer Tillman. Um, if Bill is listening to this, um, I will admit I agree with him. They are the worst broadcast crew in the country. But they were they were trying to play up this whole, like, Sean Clifford's ineffective and they're going to pull him for Drew Aller. Um, so it was just... It's just right this, on the this, same this wavelength with last week on the ESPN bottom line when it said Sean Clifford removed coach's decision. Yeah, same same wavelength as that. Um, I, I forgot about that. Um, but they are... Um, it, it's just J James Franklin. I lost my train of thought there for a minute. James Franklin was asked about this after the game. You know, what, you know, why did you handle it the way that you did? And he brought up a point that I think was missed a little bit, um, or maybe not thought about. That one of the reasons they kept Clifford in longer is because of how beat up they are on the offensive line, which to me was a kind of tacit admission that we didn't want to put a guy back there that's our future in a in crappy weather with yeah. an offensive line that is missing three starters, but for all intents and purposes with Tangwall, Caden Wallace and Fashanu, you know, we're, we're not going to risk that. And then when he did get in, it was obviously a very vanilla game plan. It's 30 to nothing at that point. The weather is deteriorating rapidly. Um, I think it was just 
probably got deemed early on and probably in coaches meetings that this is not a week in a situation where we probably want to force, even if the game, you know, is in hand, we're going to be, we're going to be more careful with how we handle him this week than we have maybe in previous weeks where the offensive line was in a better, better shape. The weather conditions were more conducive to letting him go out there and, you know, get more reps throwing the ball. Um, Whether that's right or wrong, you know, is anyone's opinion. I have no problem with it. Um, I think there's this, in my opinion, misplaced perception that the only way a, a young quarterback like that can develop is by getting reps in a game, you know, regardless of the situation. Um, clearly, and, and I've hit on this before, they have made the decision that the best way to handle Drew Aller's long-term development is to have him back up Sean Clifford, get whatever reps he's getting in practice. We get, you know, the 15 minutes the media is in every week and we read tweets about, you know, who did what. We're not in there. The other, you know, 19 hours and 45 minutes, whatever it is, they're allowed to practice um, per week. Um, we're not in the meeting rooms. We're not aware of all these other things that are going on to, let's be honest, get him ready to start, you know, game one in 2023 against whoever it is they play in game one next year. Um, I think that's the West Virginia game, actually. Um, and I think th- those, those game reps are almost inconsequential, you know, certainly in the, in the, in the, the very narrow scope of, of Saturday's game against Maryland, but really throughout the year, they have had a plan. They've stuck to the plan. We'll find out if it's right or wrong, but I think you and I agree that James Franklin and Mike Yurcich are pretty good football coaches. They're good at what they do. I'm going to trust that they know what they're doing with, with how to handle a guy like Drew Aller with where he's at in terms of his readiness to play big 10 football. Yeah. We talk a lot about how, um, we think James Franklin and his staff have earned the benefit of the doubt when it comes to like offering a kid um, like on the recruiting trail, offering a kid with like no stars or three stars after they blow up at a camp. Or uh, we talk about how we think they've earned the benefit of the doubt when it comes to like coaching hires, like, uh, like you see like somebody out of left field, like, I don't know about the guy. Well, James Franklin's done a really good job of hiring coaches. So I like, I think those are two things that we really commonly give this staff Um, benefit of the doubt for i think something else that we should be giving them more benefit of the doubt for is their handling of younger players because it's really really easy to look at this situation and say oh franklin's keeping clifford in there because he yeah he's too uh he's too loyal to his guy or you know something like that first of all we've never seen james franklin in a situation like this with this type of backup quarterback you know behind the longtime starter so it's that's a ridiculous leap to take i think um but to say that he and his staff have been hesitant or have like have shown loyalty to older players just because they're older i think is ridiculous the other one that always gets pointed to is like oh well why was koa farmer starting over michael parsons then first of all michael parsons played more snaps than koa farmer did that year and you know if you go back and watch it, it's easy to forget now because he's he is michael parsons and he's the best defensive player in all of football in the entire world but it's really it's really easy to forget. If you go back and you watch him as a freshman, like he had a lot of freshman moments on the field. Like he was not ready to play full-time snaps. I don't think, I don't think it's fair to decide as a fan sitting on your couch that Franklin isn't starting drew Aller because of loyalty or because he's like, like, do you think he's actively hurting the team? Like, do you really think James, James Franklin wants to beat Michigan and Ohio state so badly he wants to win the Big Ten again so badly. Do you really think that he's going to give his team a worse chance at doing that just because he feels some sense of loyalty to a kid that's, you know, been there for however four years? What like that's that entire sentiment is so ridiculous to me. Um, like, and if if you if you think that it should be Aller because you want him to get reps for the future of their program, like that's one thing, but at that point, what are you playing for? Like they have a chance to win 10 games this year. And they always did have a chance to win 10 games this year. And like at at a certain point, like that matters considering the last few years, winning 10 games this year is important. It matters for the perception of the program and for the, the, uh, the confidence of the current staff and players. I I I don't get it. I don't get it. When Flip and I um, did the recap for the Ohio state game a couple of weeks ago, and we had, of course, we had this debate because we've had this discussion on every podcast we've done since August, it seems like. And 
like you like you said, this James Franklin's job is to win football games for Penn State. He is tasked with finding the best personnel to put on the field to do that. And for 10 games now, he has deemed that Sean Clifford is the guy. And it's really hard to argue with that. They've won, you know, eight of their 10 games. Yep. I don't think anyone in their thinking clearly would say that if Drew Aller started the Michigan game or the Ohio State game, that the results are are, are different. Um, I don't think quarterback play, um, as much as you want to point to turnovers and whatnot against Ohio State, I don't think Drew Aller, you know, avoids JTT bull rushing Bryce Efner and forcing strip sacks and making just freak athletic plays to intercept screen passes. Yeah. Um, but I think the other thing that gets forgotten in this is James Franklin's job is to win football games, but this isn't the NFL. This isn't pro sports where, you know, there's the throwaway year, you know, how does James Franklin go into not only his locker room and explain to, you know, a Parker Washington or a Mitchell Tinsley or a PJ Mustafer or Jair Brown that, you know what, you know, we, we, you know, we don't have a chance to win the big 10 now. So we're going to, we're going to punt on the rest of your last season playing college football for Penn state and give the other guy reps um, to get him ready for next year. Even if it costs us a game or two, I'm of the opinion. I don't think it would cost them a game or two based on who was on the schedule after the Ohio state game. But I talk on a podcast for free and James Franklin gets paid a lot of money to make a much harder decision, uh, make that really difficult decision. So I'm going to defer, defer to what he has to do. Right. And then you take that even a step further. He has to go into families, living rooms and kitchens when he's recruiting players and tell them that he's trying to do the best thing for their son's development and for their son's success personally. And then as on the team. And how do you do that when you, basically decide the last month of the year, I'm going to spend developing a guy for the next year that may, that isn't my best chance to win games and to win 10 games to the very specific point this year. That um, could turn around that, and walk out the door tomorrow if they wanted to. Yeah. It's, it's like I said, this isn't, I think sometimes we look at, you know, I'm a Cleveland Browns fan. They're perpetually rebuilding. It seems like, and yes, you know, you go into the year, you know what? Yep. This is a year that, you know, they'll be lucky to win six games or whatever your team is, baseball, football, hockey, basketball, whatever you're tanking for the draft pick. Obviously it doesn't exist in college sports. And like I said earlier, game reps, aren't the only way to develop a guy. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of guys, quarterbacks and otherwise in the eight years, James Franklin's been here, get better, you know, go from not really being seen at all the previous year to the, you know, look at Olu Fashanu. You know, was sitting behind Rashid Walker, got yep. some time, you know, got worked in. Now he's a potential top 10 NFL draft pick. You know, that happens in college sports. These are young men that develop physically and um, mentally and, and, you know, you know, become better overall players in all fat and every, in every sense of the term. And just because Drew Aller isn't playing, you know, two more series against Maryland or starting against Rutgers doesn't mean that he's not getting the best development that he can get for what he is at the moment. Right. And you know, maybe, maybe I could see the argument differently if Sean Clifford was like a junior and had another year upcoming yeah. and you knew that Aller needed to be your guy. Like at that point, then the situation is very comparable to Justin Fields at Georgia. Um, but like, I, you know, the, the easy thing everyone always does. Oh, well, this is exactly the same as Kelly Bryant and Trevor Lawrence. Like you are, you're, if you had made the switch to Drew Aller, like the way that Clemson did to Trevor Lawrence, maybe we're talking about a national championship. It's just such like Trevor Lawrence is one of the best recruits of all time. Like, I think he was, I think he was the maybe like number like two or three overall recruit ever. And, he, he, and I know Quinn was, Ewers un, well, he unseated was a per, him. He was but. a perfect, he was the number one recruit consensus. I don't know what his you know, overall all time ranking is, but you know, that's again, if I said this going into the year, if quarterback was the difference between Penn state being a national title contender and being an, you know, a 10 win team, then yeah, it's, it's probably a more, a conversation more pertinent. If you thought that Drew Aller was, you know, that, you know, the guy that was going to take, you know, the, that missing piece as great as this year has been, there are still other holes on the roster, you know, quarterback play isn't what, you know, it certainly is what lost in the Michigan game. You know, it was a inability to stop Blake Corm and Donovan Edwards for rushing for 9,000 yards. Yeah. Um, 
you know, the Ohio State game, yes, we, I'm not going to rehash the whole thing, but quarterback play is not the reason that Penn State is 8-2 and two instead of 10-0. and oh. And even if it is, I'm not sure, knowing what we knew of Drew Aller as a recruit, not to take a single thing away from his his ceiling, but it was always known that he was far from a finished product, whereas Trevor Lawrence was as close to a finished product at quarterback as you're going to find coming out of high school. Right. Um, I just, I just, it's, it's, that's an, it's not an apples and apples comparison to look at what Clemson did several years ago and, and look at where Penn state is. You know, I think we mentioned this earlier in the year that, um, you know, Sean Clifford didn't come back for his sixth year, which was a possibility up until about a year ago now um, that they were going to, they were going to actively look to bring in a transfer quarterback. You know, this, they, they, you know, independent of what Sean Clifford decided to do, um, they were prepared to not have Drew Aller. They didn't want to have Drew Aller be their starting quarterback at Purdue back in September, or I guess yeah. it was August. Yeah, uh, I, <clears throat> that's a really good point too that you brought up. I because I I think a lot of people know, or um, maybe some people know, like when Penn State first offered Drew Aller, I think was he still a three star or a low yeah. four star? Yeah, like for a lot of guys, it's just a difference of. Um, like they haven't been seen at the right camps or stuff like that. That wasn't the case for Drew Aller. Like Drew Aller legitimately improved over the course of his junior senior season. I remember I his uh his quarterbacks coach, I remember they posted a video of the difference in just his throwing motion and the velocity gets in the ball from I think like sophomore year through senior year. And it was striking. Like this dude this was not this is not the same Drew Aller that he was. And like Trevor Lawrence, like he was that guy in eighth grade. Like Trevor Lawrence was ready to play college football very, very early on. So it's a, it's a great point that I think we miss a lot of the time. Like Drew Aller is very much still improving and very much still learning. Like there's a reason that he was not like there. It was very much still a competition in the spring between um, all three of the backup quarterbacks behind Sean Clifford. Like it was not a clear cut thing. And I feel like we had heard at one point that maybe even Prabula was the one leading the pack. Um, so that's, that's a great point. The Drew Aller is very much still learning. Um, obviously an immensely talented kid. Like there is a reason he is the number two quarterback now. And he passed you know, Christian Veyer. Christian Veyer is a, he's a solid college quarterback. I think he could very easily transfer somewhere else and have a, a perfectly fine college career. Uh, Prabula, we've heard great things about. Aller has earned this spot now and he has an immense talent and an insane ceiling. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it comes back to, I, I think we both agree. Like if he was ready to be the starting quarterback at Penn state, he would be starting quarterback right now. Like I, I everything that I think I understand about Sean Clifford, like if he, if Aller was legitimately better than him, like I don't think Clifford's going to be the kind of guy who would like, who would made a big fuss or like, like yelled about Franklin and the media or something. If he had lost his job to Aller, like that's not, I don't think that's the situation here. I think this really is what's best for the team. Um, I think the staff is handling this the right way. I look forward to hearing all of the comments in YouTube about how you disagree with us or on Twitter or wherever you choose to leave your comments about this portion of the podcast. Matt, I think that's enough ranting. I, I'm sure we've made uh, Matt Flip angry enough if he's still listening <laughs> at this point. Um, do you have any final thoughts about, um, like we've gone pretty macro here, so about you know Penn State in general or this Maryland game or anything else? The only other thing I wanted to mention, um, and I think we would be remiss if we did not, is um, Zariah Fisher got mm, on the yes. field um, at defensive end on Saturday, um, recorded a tackle. I missed it because it was late in the game, and I had kind of tuned out at that point. Um, but this is a kid back in, I think it was the spring, suffered spring. Yeah. a season-ending, what we were told then was, was a likely season-ending injury. And there's been hints that he's been doing more and more in practice, you know, the, the open sessions on Wednesday. Um, Obviously still, you know, a year or almost a year away going, you know, looking at the 2023 season from being a really, you know, significant, significant contributor, um, but really, really cool to see him, um, you know, work his way back to at least get on the field and, and get a few snaps, um, you know, break through that, that, um, that first step in, in his recovery. I think it was an Achilles injury. Um, mm -hmm. So to see him back, you know, being, able to, being healthy enough. Most importantly, to be able to get on the field is really cool, and um, you know, hopefully, a really positive sign for um, where he's at going into the off season to, to hopefully get ready to compete for a, a bigger role next year. Yeah, yeah, totally awesome to see him out there. Um, yeah, last two quick things for me. I know you mentioned it, but really cool to see Nick Singleton 
actually run through the tackles, run through the offensive line in this game. That second touchdown was a thing of beauty um, on the fourth and one formation. Yes. Um, yeah. That it reminded is, me you know, a little bit of, of Journey Brown in the Cotton Bowl, just you know, yeah. dragging guys, pushing guys off of them. The uh, the the wing T formation that's actually wildly effective. That's not a subtweet. Um, and then uh, if we talk about uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, Joey Porter Jr. In case anybody was unaware who just watched the broadcast, uh, he was not out due to injury. He was out due to uh, whatever they term it, non disclosed team personal reason, whatever I, it is. I, I think there was so Ben Jones tweeted that he was out due to non football reasons. Everyone else on the beat tweeted that it was a non football injury. So I, he didn't look injured. I don't know. Who, who, who I mean, knows? I, again, Franklin said we hope to have him back soon. So um, I, I have no idea what the 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 uh, what's going on below the surface there. But I'm I'm kind of fascinated to find out now because um, I mean, who really knows what's going on? There? I was a, a certainly surprised. There wasn't any indication until about an hour, maybe less than that, before the game that he was going to be out. That's a tough one. Do you trust Ben or do you trust the entire rest of the beat? That's a t- like if if it was like Audrey we'll, we'll or get, Fitz uh, or somebody on their island, that's a little different. But no, with Ben, I love Ben. I think, but I think yeah. Audrey might have had a tweet about. It. I have to go back and look I, again. They kind of got there are about nine tweets all in a row because he's you know, obviously they're all at the press conference and they all hear it at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Um. Because I saw Ben's first and then I saw you know a half dozen or whatever others. Um. So who knows? And I'm I haven't seen anything today. Um. In, in the the aftermath that has shed any light on exactly what the situation is or what James Franklin actually said, I guess might be more pertinent. Yeah. And please, that is not a slight at Ben Jones. Love Ben, known Ben for a while. Uh, we love all of our fellow Penn State media folks, as long as you're not somebody who actively roots for Sean Clifford to get injured. But with that, I think that is enough for today, Matt. I think we can get it. Go ahead and get out of here. Um, thanks to everybody for listening. If you haven't already, please make sure that you like and subscribe the podcast wherever you can listen. Leave us a five-star review on Apple or Spotify if you can. Leave a comment with a question. We'll happily answer it. Make sure you also, also subscribe on YouTube and hit the alert bell so you can get all of our videos first thing when they pop up. I am Nick Pollock. Thanks to everybody for watching and listening. For my co-host, Matt DeBear, go State.